very good day to all our viewers. My name is Zeenat Islam and I'm the Relations Manager Academia Network at UNO Center. Welcome to lecture six of the YSBC Web Lecture Series. The topic for today's conversation is how the largest bank in Europe created its own social business. With us, we have today as our speaker, Mr. Jean-Luc Perron, who's currently the Vice President of Unicenter Paris. However, Mr. Perron has previously worked with the Credit Agricole Group, the largest banking group in France. He has worked as the head of the International Affiliates Division, Chief Advisor for EU Affairs to the CEO of the bank. As from 2007, Mr. Perron has played a material role in the design, then the setting up and management of the Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation. The Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation is a multi-business operator whose mission is to contribute towards the fight of po against poverty by promoting financial inclusion and entrepreneurship with social impact. The foundation has four main activities and coordinates solidarity bankers, credit agricole groups, skilled volunteering program. Our moderator today is Professor Ashir Ahmed, who's the Associate Professor, Kyushu University, Japan. His research aims to produce technologies to achieve social goals. Towards this goal, he established the Global Communication Center inside Grameen and developed a research team at Kyushu University. So without further delay, let us kickstart our session and welcome Professor Mohamed Yunus for his opening remarks. Professor Yunus. Thank you, Zinat. Welcome to everybody. We are now back in our uh, lecture series. This is our uh, sixth lecture. I'm very happy that you could join us. This is a fascinating uh, occasion because we'll have the story from uh, Jean-Luc Perron about the largest bank in Europe. It's not only the largest bank in Paris, France, it's the largest bank in Europe, uh, Credit Agricole. Why it changed its mind or why it put attention to something called microcredit, why it got interested in social business, uh, that is something uh, very interesting. Everybody would like to know. So this is the story will be told today by no other than the uh, hero of the story himself, Jean-Luc Perron. He's the one uh, who created, who made this difference, uh, the connections between the largest bank uh, in Europe to connect with the bank which lends money, small money to the poor people, poor women in Bangladesh. And the idea is to see how that largest bank can make itself available to do the same thing. So coming from the largest bank to come to the small finance, to small people, that's a quite a, a bold decision for them. How it happened, that's the story which will be told today. And I'm very happy that uh, Jean-Luc Perron is participating in this, telling the story and will be benefiting from his story. And it will be uh, moderated by uh, our good friend, uh, Professor Ashir Ahmed of Kyushu University. He's a hero of social business himself. He knows he has done a lot of work, but he will be leading the conversation, trying to extract things from uh, uh, Jean-Luc Perron, how uh, he uh, made it happen, how he convinced or he persuaded uh, the whole bank. And not only he himself came to Bangladesh, he brought the general manager of the bank, uh, of the Credit Agricole, uh, Georges Poget, with him to come to Bangladesh. Uh, we had no idea that they are coming, what they were going to talk about, but they came. And they spent several days trying to explain to me, explain to Grameen uh, how they can work together and in the purpose, the same objective as the Grameen is working. So out of this whole thing came the idea of creating a joint venture, joint venture social business as a Grameen Credit Agricole Microfinance Foundation. Indeed, a fascinating story. I'm sure uh, Professor Ashir Ahmed will bring it out to his conversation. I hope you'll be enjoying this conversation. I invite Professor Ashir Ahmed to take the floor, and the floor is yours. Lead the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for introducing me and also uh, introducing John Luke. So <clears throat> from now, it's um, my job and my it's my really honor to uh, introduce uh, John Luke and introduce his story, how uh, he uh, created, uh, not only created, he contributed in the social business world, and also how he became a hero in your world in uh, in the social business arena. 
So uh, without any delay, uh, let me ask you a few questions, John Luke. So uh, if I look, you, look at your uh, CV, you have been very happy in the French uh, Ministry of Agriculture as the head of the budget division. Then you became the financial advisor uh, to the minister. And uh, you moved to Credit Agricole at the time. It was uh, uh, part of uh, Apex body of Credit Agricole group. And it says it's the largest banking group in France. So uh, my first question, uh, you have been happy with that. So how did, did your start, journey um, start uh, and you uh, came to uh, came to the world of uh, microfinance and the idea of creating microfinance foundation. Thank you, Ashia. Thank you, Professor Yunus, for your kind words. Uh, it's a privilege for me being number six. I would have preferred to be number 007, like James Bond, but okay. <laughs> Let me be number 006 in the series <laughs> of the heroes. Well, what a, what a world. <laughs> Well, just Ashia, thank you very much uh, taking your time from Japan, a long time, long to long way, <laughs> uh, to, to, to uh, conduct this conversation. Uh, well, if I may say, well, I've been working with Critical Call for 30 years, uh, filling different positions. It's not a matter now to, to describe these positions, whatever they are. Um, but I've always paid interest in emerging countries and developing countries. I'd just like to mention that uh, in the years uh, 90s, I started to, I played a quite, I would say, material role in the setting up of a cooperative bank in Armenia. Uh, it's uh, a, a bank dedicated to smallholder farmers in, in this very small country. The bank was established uh, sometime in 96, 97. Uh, at the time, I was not aware of the word microfinance. I was not aware of Professor Yunus even. Uh, but uh, in fact, what we were doing was very similar to a certain extent. Then later on, uh, I had the opportunity for various reasons, I will not go into the details, to play a, a, a quite active role in the organization of a conference held in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Uh, for the first time, uh, uh, this conference was putting together leaders from uh, agricultural banks from over in the world. Uh, so it was a three-day conference in uh, this country and about 60 leaders, uh, presidents or top managers of Creta Ecole attended this conference. And the hosting organization in Ethiopia was not a, a bank because there was no agricultural bank in, uh, in Ethiopia, but the Association of Ethiopian Microfinance Institutions. So it was more or less my first contact in November 2005 with the world of microfinance in a very poor country, in a country where about more or less 95% of people are unbanked. So we are very much in the case where microfinance uh, feels a need for the poor people to have some kind of uh, financial uh, facility to develop some projects even at a very small scale. So I was impressed by that, of course, but not only me. The people from Critical Recall were impressed, were, were discovering, uh, I would say, this new way of making bank banking for, for uh, unusual, I would say, clients, very poor people. Uh, so later on, I just mentioned this anecdote. Uh, I tried to develop some kind of a technical assistance program in the form of a twinning program between three MFI, microfinance institutions in Ethiopia, and three regional banks of Credit Agricole. Maybe Professor Yunus, you are not aware of that, this anecdote, but in fact, I tried to do that uh, to, to introduce this project to the relevant bodies of Credit Agricole. And to my big disappointment, this program, this project was rejected. It made me very upset, I would say. Uh, why? Uh, well, it was a quite small scale project. To just for technical assistance, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so probably that's from this time that it triggered the idea that maybe we should do something specific with an ad hoc entity, whatever it is, a found a foundation, I had no idea at the time. And uh, after some time, I submitted the idea to my CEO, Georges Proget. I remember perfectly well 
that was just before uh, the uh, Christmas holidays in France. Uh, he was leaving his office and I gave him a memo saying, well, George, uh, I've been thinking about what Credit Agricole could do in the field of microfinance in developing countries. Uh, it could make sense for Credit Agricole for various reasons. Maybe you will come to this point later on. Uh, and okay, George Poget was quite uh, sympathetic to the idea. I said, okay, I was, I'm interested by the idea. I was thinking about it. So he took the memo and afterwards, we had a kind of working group within Criteria Call to elaborate about the idea. Next step was uh, a little bit by chance, by, uh, it was not planned, but uh, we were invited by Christian Noyer, the then governor of Banque de France in March 2007, uh, to uh, participate in a breakfast meeting with Professor Yunus. Professor Yunus had got the Nobel Peace Prize just a few months before, he was visiting France, and the governor of Banque de France, which was a very good initiative, I think, took the, decided to invite representatives of all French banks for a breakfast meeting just to let us know more about uh, Grameen Bank, about uh, microcredit. And uh, of course, as I was already working about it, uh, I was uh, sent to this meeting and uh, uh, afterwards, I had a private meeting with Professor Yunus together with uh, Martin, a consultant from HEC. And while well, Professor Yunus does not remember, he, he's meeting so many people. So uh, we are talking about uh, 13 years ago. But I remember very well. Uh, he was with Lamia at the time. Uh, but OK, this meeting was just, I would say, a first introduction meeting. Uh, more importantly, we decided, to George Poget and myself and uh, this consultant as well, to go to Bangladesh end of July 2007, because it was more important to not only to meet with Professor Yunus, but to meet with <coughs> himself and to, to get aware of uh, how the bank, the concept of the bank was created, was developed. And we took also this opportunity to visit the recently established uh, Gramin, Danone Gramin Food uh, Limited in Bogra. So we spent five days at the time of the Musun. Yeah, look, no uh, we will come to this, uh, okay. to this story. Uh, <clears throat> let me get my audience so that they understand what we are uh, talking about. It's a fascinating story. So before you go to Bangladesh, let me see, uh, let me um, introduce a couple of things with the audience. So uh, Credit Agricole, from the name itself, uh, people may not know what oh, yeah. it is. So it's a bank, right? You are right, it's, it's a bank. bank. It's a bank, <laughs> okay. So it's a bank like HSBC Bank, Citibank, et cetera. Oh, it's nice. also a bank. It's quite different compared to HSBC and other banks because if I, if I may, uh, and it's important for our conversation but because the bank was born at the end of the 19th century as a cooperative bank. Mm -hmm. It started uh, at the grassroots as a local small mutual bank. If we were to create this type of local banks right now, we would call them microfinance institutions because the concept was exactly the same. Local, small, based on cooptation, based on solidarity, and based on local on democracy, uh, democratic governance. But and later- I find some keywords here, um, small, yeah. uh, and it's cooperative, uh, yeah. everything. How did it become the largest bank in, in France? It's a long story. It started very small at the local level. Very soon, at the end of the 19th century, sometime in 1899, if I remember well, <laughs> we created a second tier, a second tier a regional level in order to be more efficient. But for many years, and later on in the years 1920s, uh, uh, the government took the initiative to create an apex body uh, in the form of a public agency called Caisse Nationale de Crédit Agricole. So from that time, the uh, system was in place, but still working at a very modest level. Uh, but later on in the 60s, this network of local banks, of cooperative banks became more and more powerful and uh, started to uh, enlarge its competences from agriculture, which was at the beginning the unique purpose of a bank to other types of activities, SMEs and individuals and households, not only in the rural part of France, but also more and more in the cities. And to the surprise of some people, the bank 
became the largest bank in France because uh, and uh, <clears throat> because not mainly because of agriculture because agriculture in France in relative terms became less uh, important. Uh, but uh, housing, for example, we are the main bank for uh, we. I'm no longer with Credit Agricole, but I should say Credit Agricole is the largest bank for housing uh, with a market share of about 25%, which is a very big business. And last element of the story, the bank decided to become very universal and to, to develop not only banking activities, but also other types of financial activities. So Credit Agricole is very strong today in the field of life insurance and non-life insurance very strong in the field of asset management with Amundi and relatively uh, strong and uh, also in the field of investment bank. So I will not develop that, but today Credit Agricole is a very diversified group with a strong basis in retail banking in France with about 25% market share and with an extensive network of 8,000 branches everywhere in France. So compared to that, uh, there is no competition, I would say. <laughs> Many villages, Credit Agricole is a unique bank. Uh, uh, Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for introducing uh, Credit Agricole. I think now the audience can understand that it's a bank. It's not uh, very different than other bank, but it, ha it does a uh, lot of functions. And um, the universality and also the solidarity, and also I think the empathy that you mentioned, that he really worked with the uh, people. So uh, by working for people, the bank became the, one of the largest bank in France. So now let's go uh, back to your story. So, <clears throat> so uh, in uh, uh, Credit Agricole, you had your position, then you convinced uh, your superiors and you came to Dhaka. So yeah. we were in that story. So now um, <laughs> let us go back, like what happened in Dhaka? How did you, what did you tell to Professor Yunus? How did you convince him and uh, what happened? Well, uh, Professor Yunus could comment about it. Uh, we came uh, to Dhaka. Uh, well, first thing, no photographs, no journalists. The purpose was not to communicate, to make big announcements, it was just to, to, uh, to get information and to understand and to discuss and to elaborate about a joint project. At the very beginning, I would say that maybe Professor Yunus was a little bit, uh, sus not suspicious, but a little bit lost about what was the purpose. Who are these people? Why are they coming? Uh, uh, are they ready to do something seriously, uh, et cetera? But OK, as we decided to stay five days, uh, we had several occasions to talk. And uh, after our first meeting we had the first day, after that, uh, we went to Bogra. We visited the Grameen Bank. And, and we met with, uh, with the clients, with the Grameen ladies, etc. Uh, and we were back to Dhaka. And then I drafted a memorandum of understanding of what could be our cooperation in order to establish, I would not say a foundation. It was not that clear at that time. But I would say a structure, not a body dedicated to the support of microfinance. And then we had a final meeting with Professor Yunus uh, mm -hmm. to have the social business uh, in the purpose of this ad hoc uh, entity. Uh, and at the end of the meeting, I think that we had a good understanding of each other. I met with Professor so Latif. Before you met him, you went to Bogra to yeah. see how Grameen Bank works. Yeah, and, and also Danone Factory as well. Danone Factory as a social business. So you yeah. saw both the microfinance activities and also um, you had the opportunity to visit the um, social business activity by Grameen Danone. So you came back and you wrote the proposal and um, uh, the meeting started with Professor Yunus. Okay, please go ahead. Exactly. And Professor Yunus at the end said that he was at ease with this paper, uh, with this memorandum of understanding, but a little bit to a surprise, he said, okay, but I will not sign it right now. <laughs> uh, saying, okay, I would like to share this project, this idea, this uh, memorandum with my colleagues, uh, because we didn't have time to talk uh, together with about it. Well, we are a little bit disappointed because, of course, uh, we, have, we had our flight back to, to Paris and we could have the impression that maybe it was a way to, okay, to say politely, no to the project and to say, okay, I would like, but my colleagues don't want, don't like it or something like that. But no, it didn't happen this way. Uh, just 10 days later, or I was back to my, to my summer uh, holidays uh, as the Georges Projet uh, as well. 
And uh, we got uh, the feedback from Dakar saying, okay, no, we, we are ready to sign this model of understanding with a few amendments, but nothing very significant, I would say. So uh, based on that, just two weeks later, the board of directors, three weeks maybe, it was end of August, uh, the board of directors of Credit Agricole SA, the apex body of Credit Agricole Group, uh, approved the principle of setting up uh, a foundation uh, jointly with Grameen, dedicated, et cetera, et cetera. And I was in charge of preparing the project. I jumped to the last uh, phase, I would say, last steps. Uh, a new board of a meeting of the board of directors uh, in January 2008 approved the final structure and decided to endow the foundation with 50 million euro, five zero, uh, as endowment at inception, which of course is quite significant. Uh, and uh, we decided to make a big announcement uh, of the new Grameen Critical Foundation, because we call it under the two names, on February 18th, if I remember well, uh, in 2008, with uh, uh, some very important persons like uh, Jacques Chirac, who former French president, with, uh, of course, uh, Franck Ribou and Emmanuel Faber from Danone, with uh, uh, Maria Novak from Adi and uh, some others, and Jacques Attali. And so we made a big conference, press conference, a big meeting with all leaders of Great Recall, and everybody was very, very happy about it. It still took about eight, nine months you know, before we established the foundation according to the law of Luxembourg. And so we had the first board meeting uh, of the foundation on October 4th in Luxembourg with Professor Yunus as a board member, Professor Latifi, but also with the Grand Duchesse of Luxembourg and under the chairmanship of René Caron, the then president of Credit Agricole SC. So uh, it was a big uh, emotional moment for me because I was appointed managing director of the foundation. And two months later, before Christmas time, we delivered the first loan to a microfinance institution in Senegal, it was Cori. We were committed to do that before here hand, and we succeeded. It was done beginning of December. It was the first loan disbursed by the foundation in Thank Senegal. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, let me get in touch with the uh, audience as well. I, I think this is a very exciting story to know that uh, uh, you, uh, with um, uh, your uh, superior, your boss, you went to Dhaka to uh, meet Professor Yunus. They had the meetings, but Professor Yunus at the beginning, um, he, was, uh, he wanted to know more about you and before he uh, signed the agreement. Uh, <clears throat> that's fascinating because the largest bank from Europe coming to Professor Yunus as a micro credit, and then um, you're proposing to work together, but uh, he took uh, some time, but it's, uh, I'm glad to hear that in one week he called you back and then um, uh, you had this agreement to start uh, the microfinance activity. So uh, the very first question, so when you started microfinance activity, you didn't do it in France, but you started doing it in other countries. The first microfinance activity was in Senegal. Is that correct? Yeah, well, uh... We had some internal discussion within Criteri Call uh, between the time of our visit to Dakar and uh, the announcement which was made uh, beginning of 2008. And we had to clarify a point because the first idea of Georges Poget, my CEO, was to have uh, a foundation or whatever the name of uh, the st structure uh, delivering this type of uh, financial services to the end bank, not only in a uh, developing country, but also why not in France? But this idea was not accepted by the representative of the regional banks of Credit Agricole saying, okay, that's our business, that's our purpose. Uh, Credit Agricole SA as the APEX structure uh, was not accepted uh, as uh, doing this type of thing in France. So finally, after some discussion, it was decided that the new foundation would be fully dedicated and only dedicated to uh, microfinance and social business in uh, very poor countries. Does not mean that Credit Agricole is not doing anything in France, but it's done in a more decentralized way through the regional banks who put in place various uh, approach methods to 
to support people who are in financial troubles, uh, like Passerelle. But okay, it's not the purpose today to discuss there. So finally, and well, to be quite frank with you, uh, microfinance in developing countries, they're putting in place micro loans of $100, $200 uh, with a very specific methodology in Ethiopia, in Senegal, wherever, is quite different from the French context. So uh, maybe not putting all things together was a good idea. Uh, I think that we had to, to, to be focused on uh, developing countries. So uh, we didn't want to, uh, well, we were ready to establish a foundation, but not to do the same thing as the others. So we tried to uh, design the foundation in such a way that it would fill the gap, it would uh, address a need uh, which was not covered by existing investment funds because you are maybe aware, even 10 years ago, there were already big uh, investment funds dedicated to microfinance in a more, I would say, commercial way. Uh, responsibility, blue orchard, and some others, uh, etc. So we decided that the foundation would go to the poorest countries first, and mainly to sub-Saharan African countries, uh, where microfinance was much more uh, in an early phase of development. Yeah, you have mentioned that in uh, Ethiopia, almost like 95% people were unbanked at the time. So Yeah, but that situation was the same in many uh, sub-Saharan African Africa. countries. Maybe exactly. not 95, but 90%, yes. Uh, so we went to, decided to go first and mainly to sub-Saharan African countries, so, uh, Western African countries, of course, the French speaking, but not only, also to Kenya, uh, for example, Tanzania, uh, and more recently, Uganda, etc. Uh, and uh, second, we decided to uh, give a high priority to microfinance institutions dedicated to the, to the farmers, to the farming sector, and to the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Third, we decided to focus on what we call in the jargon, the tier three microfinance institution, meaning uh, in the pyramid, in terms of size, the, the most, uh, the smallest one. Not the, not the very small, because uh, it was not possible from Paris to necessarily to, to, to get in touch with very small institutions, but nevertheless, tier three institutions, relatively small for relatively small loans. And then we de developed a double set of criteria to decide uh, what kind of microfinance institutions would be uh, eligible to our financial facilities in the form of mainly loans, guarantees, and to a lesser extent, technical assistance. So a uh, double set of criteria. First, some management criteria, of course, good management, good discipline, good methodology. Of course, if we were to make a loan, we want to be, this loan to be repaid. Uh, second, uh, social impact criteria to uh, assess the capacity of, uh, and the willingness of the institution to, to go to the poorest, to the women, and to, to serve well-adapted uh, loans, microcredits to these people in such a way that it really uh, benefit them. So we developed this methodology with the uh, support of a few partners like Cerise, a French entity dedicated to uh, social impact assessment methodology, uh, and later on with the SPTF, the Social Performance Task Force. Okay, so this way yeah, we have been yeah. of uh, loans, which today, as I understand from my successor, amounts to nearly 100 million euro outstandings. Excellent. I just wanted to ask you a few more questions about the achievements. So you started uh, microfinance. So let's go uh, play with some um, uh, facts and figures. So uh, you raised 30, you know, five zero million uh, euros for the foundation and you um, started microfinance operations in uh, African countries. So uh, how many countries did you uh, uh, go and uh, how many uh, microfinance institutions uh, have you contacted and how many borrowers, what was the repayment rate, how successful was it? Yeah, uh, well, of course, uh, we are talking about uh, features and, and figures of today. So uh, 
will not go back to my time, but nevertheless, it. Um, so as far as I know, today the foundation has a portfolio of 100 million euro outstanding loans to microfinance. Uh, they are. Uh, they have an activity in 40 different countries. There are half of them in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they are serving, uh, teaming up with uh, over 70 microfinance institutions in the world. Uh, and altogether, these 70 or 71 MFIs have altogether eight million, over 8 million clients, beneficiaries, of, wow. of which 85% are women, and of which uh, 78% are dedicated, specialized in rural areas and far the farming sector. So you see that we st the foundation is uh, still sticking to its purpose, to its vocation, serving, uh, going to the poorest countries, to the smallest MFIs, to the women, to the rural areas. Uh, I am not aware of the uh, performance in the financial performance right now of today, because they are no, no longer involved for the last four years. Right. But at the time when uh, I was managing the foundation, the def default rate on the microfinance portfolio was in the range of 0.7%, very small, despite mm -hmm. all loans were made without any collateral, based only on our analysis or capacity to assess the capacity of the microfinance institution to pay back uh, the loan and based on trust, of course, uh, because without trust, there is no business in uh, this field. Right. So, uh, there is a question from, uh, uh, sorry, please go ahead. No, that's okay, but just- uh, uh, Is it okay? So if I can remember in uh, 2008, you started in 2007, the operation started in 2008, then uh, you've been there until 2015. So you um, operated for eight years. So 2008, if I remember, there was uh, the Lehman shock at the time. So all the big banks were collapsing, but you with this microfinance institution, you are growing up. What is the secret? <laughs> well, uh, first I have been lucky. The first secret is luck. <laughs> <laughs> because some of my colleagues told, yeah, you are lucky because if you had launched the foundation just a few months later, maybe the board would not have accepted that as easily uh, because uh, the board uh, approved the project unanimously in January 2008, which was a lot at the very beginning of a crisis, not, but the beginning nevertheless, uh, there were already uh, some uh, announcements about the crisis at the time. Uh, so, well, uh, I've been lucky to maybe to get the approval just on time, just before this big crisis. Then, of course, as you know, microfinance is, a, is, uh, is not connected with a big business, with a big uh, banking business. Uh, there is no, uh, no, how to say, uh, elements to, to, to create a kind of uh, solidarity between this world of microfinance and uh, the banking business. So no, we didn't have any particular problem. We uh, were developing our model or uh, our methodology uh, without any interference with uh, the crisis. But the crisis hit critical quite a lot. But uh, as we had decided from the beginning to, to set up a foundation uh, as a separate vehicle, so legally speaking, it was not possible for critical to to get back the endowment. The endowment was belonging to, to a foundation forever. And we got this endowment on day one, even before the day one of uh, setting up of the approval of a foundation. So uh, I think that it's important to, to mention that because it means that, okay, uh, you have to, to, to make sure that your good idea will be preserved in the long run and will be protected against the change of people because Georges Projet, for example, uh, left his office just two years later. Uh, and because of the crisis, uh, many things had, been, had to be changed in the bank. So why not uh, now uh, give up with uh, this uh, strange foundation, uh, which uh, is working in very poor country, nothing to do with the main business of Credit Recon. Nobody made this remark. Everybody accepted quite well uh, the foundation as a very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, to say uh, 
very good idea, but uh, I'm looking for better words for that. Uh, something which was uh, uh, giving everybody, was making everybody in the bank happy and proud. That's, uh, that's the point. And maybe I, I did. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. There is another uh, question from the audience. Uh, is it okay to have the question? Yeah. Um, uh, it's from Cam Donaldson, our friend. Uh, he's uh, saying it's a great session. Thank you. Uh, he says this credit agricole facilitated the spread of microfinance in French speaking countries to an extent that may not have otherwise been possible. No, no, we didn't make any difference between uh, French speaking or English speaking or any language speaking uh, uh, countries. Well, we, we have a significant <coughs> part of the portfolio in Western African countries, but we have been quite active in other countries, in, uh, as I mentioned, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. Uh, also in the Philippines, Indonesia, and a lot in Cambodia. You could say that Cambodia used to be a French colony, but nevertheless. <laughs> no, we have been, um, no, it was not a criterion for our activity. We have I been... see. Thank you. So uh, I think Cam uh, had the answer. So it was not, not a criteria. Uh, <clears throat> uh, doesn't matter. Language has, didn't have any issue about spreading microfinance in African countries. We are talking so much about microfinance. Uh, we may come back about the microfinance again, but uh, uh, let, let us talk about your social business part as well. Uh, so uh, the foundation worked in microfinance, foundation worked also for social business. So uh, what kind of social business did you create? Do you, can you introduce any success story about social business? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, Professor Yunus, uh, the, the beginning insisted that the foundation should also uh, deliver uh, equity stakes, uh, some kind of financial support to new companies, uh, which would uh, comply with its definition of social business, no loss, no dividend company. So, of course, we made clear to Professor Yunus at the time of our visit in Dakar that, of course, the foundation could not dedicate the, the totality of its activity to, 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 to social business because it's a very risky activity. We're talking about small companies, startup in very poor context, uh, and dedicated to with a very social purpose. So we are ready to do that, but we decided to allocate maximum 20% of the portfolio to this activity. But we started that from the very beginning. And uh, at the beginning, we well, we, of course, we had no capacity to, uh, to source, to uh, find the candidates for this uh, activity. So we relied uh, to some extent on our French partners. I mean, Danone, for example, investisseur et partenaire, who had already some experience in this field. And so we were invited by Danone to take a stake in, in the Lettrie du Berger, the Shepherd's Dairy, in Senegal, which is a big success right now, after many efforts. So we, we took, uh, I forgot the figures, but uh, well, we invested quite a significant uh, amount of money in the, in the dairy. Uh, same uh, with other companies in Madagascar, for example, uh, together jointly with investors and partners. So it has been the first way. Later on, uh, we have been able to, to identify um, other candidates, I would say, of uh, uh, potential partners in the field, uh, filling this definition of social business and uh, developing a very specific uh, business model in order to deliver the access to food, energy, but even culture, education, uh, to very poor people. And a very good example for in my mind, for top of my mind, is what we have been doing in Cambodia where we created from scratch a social business company, which was a performance company, a circus, in fact, with a big top established in Simrip, which is the city which is, uh, which is at the door of the Angkor temples with about 4 million tourists every year, except this year. By wait, wait. So you started not only in African countries, but now you're speaking about Cambodia. So you yeah. work in uh, Asian countries as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. The main focus was sub-Saharan African countries, but we were quite active also, yes, in Cambodia. We have been serving about four microfinance institutions in this country and developing two social, free social businesses. One is FAR, P-H-A-R-E, 
which is a circus, uh, but created by an NGO called Far pour le Selpa, which means in English, the lightness of art. And the purpose of the NGO is to help uh, the uh, 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 people with very poor background, uh, children, teenagers, uh, in the field of education, arts, and mainly uh, living arts, uh, and also uh, in uh, paintings, the, et cetera. So we established this company in Cambodia, but in Cambodia we supported also Mille et une Fontaine, 1001 Fontaines. It's a French NGO, French social business company developing a very specific model to give access to the people to quality water in, uh, in Cambodia. And we also took a, an equity stake in Chamron, a microfinance institution created by Entrepreneur du Monde, a French uh, NGO as well. So yes, we have been quite active in uh, other parts of the world uh, and not only in the field of agriculture, but also in the field of uh, water, education, energy. Uh, in the field of energy, we have been active in IT together with Entrepreneur du Monde, once again, with a company called uh, Palmis Energy. Energy is a Creole word, uh, equivalent to energy. Um, and the purpose of the company is to sell uh, solar lamps and, uh, uh, and uh, stoves, improve stoves to people in order to, 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 to give them a more quality life and more, capac more capacity to, uh, to make business in the streets with uh, their, uh, their stoves, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when you talk about solar lamps, were they uh, produced in uh, uh, those countries or it was produced in other country? No, and just... no uh, solar lamps is, uh, uh, unfortunately, maybe it's a worldwide uh, business. And uh, if you want to get that at a very low price, affordable to the people, you need to produce that uh, at very high scale. So in, prat in practical terms, it's a Chinese business. So. Okay. Uh, so they had to, to buy uh, the containers from China, but it was not the only purpose uh, of uh, Palmis Energy. They also developed very much uh, the sale of uh, improved uh, stoves and other, uh, other equipment for, for households, uh, again, for very poor people in the streets of uh, Haiti. Okay, thank you, John. Look, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, <clears throat> So before we uh, go to details on uh, some more question, I um, just want to share, uh, summarize uh, what we have got uh, 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 through this conversation. So uh, Jean-Luc uh, uh, was uh, working in Credit Agricole and uh, during his time, he um, established uh, a foundation and through that foundation, he raised uh, 50 million uh, euros by Credit Agricole Assay, and then Foundation supports uh, today over 70 microfinance institutions and 12 social business companies in 40 developing countries. So that's the figure we can see. It's a huge, huge number. Now I can see why Professor Yunus calls you a hero. So, uh, and you initiated that. And uh, maybe actually I should uh, take this opportunity to say I didn't do that by myself alone. I did okay. that. I've been, I had the capacity to hire a team of people from scratch. So we started just uh, two, three of, of us. And, but later on, we uh, grew up the team up to about 20 people, excellent people, very skilled, who have very good reputation in the. Yeah, in of the course, it's a, it's a teamwork. But uh, what, what I can see is the bold decision to have. People don't want to do, uh, you know, new thing, but you initiated to, you convinced uh, your people in your bank, you took the initiative to uh, convince the president of France, you had this network, you talked to John, uh, uh, Jack Atari as well, all the names that we can find in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, so you had the gut and you really uh, connected all those people and initiated this and we can see this result. So uh, that's why my conclusion was, uh, I can see why you are here. Of course, it's a teamwork, but somebody should take this bold decision to start with. So uh, that's your credit goes with. 
so coming to um, social business, and then uh, after that, uh, Professor, I think uh, there is a question from, from the audience. Somebody is asking this question. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is relevant to you right now, but uh, as a uh, pioneer in the financial sector, uh, this person is asking a question, um, what about uh, the financial situation during this COVID-19? Um, so do you uh, have any comment on like uh, microfinance and um, social business? How should it tackle COVID-19 from your understanding? I cannot go very further in this, uh, in this question because I'm no longer in charge of uh, foundations. So, uh, let's but your, your, let's... your knowledge, from your knowledge, if you have some suggestion or advice. What I know is that, yes, uh, the team of the foundation is quite active to maintain a close contact with uh, all the partners in the field. They establish an observatory of the pandemic uh, and of its impact on microfinance in, uh, in, this, uh, in these countries. And I know that they spend a lot of time and energy to reschedule uh, the repayment of loans according to the situation because, of course, because of the pandemic, many people, of course, everywhere in the world, but mainly in very developed, very poor countries, don't have the capacity to, uh, to don't have income to, uh, they were expecting from their activities because of the pandemic or because of the lockdown, uh, whatever. And so they are not in a position to pay back immediately what, uh, et cetera. So microfinance institutions could be in a very difficult situation because of that. And so the foundation, as far as I understand, is talking with each of them in order to, to amend, to uh, adapt uh, the schedule of reimbursement according to the situation. That's my main comment. But of course, it's a big shock for everybody everywhere in the world. Thank you. Uh, there is another question uh, very related to this. Uh, microcredit facilitates especially the rural and agricultural poor. Do you think underdeveloped countries should take more steps to promote microcredit so as to make it ease for banks to operate? Yes, of course. Uh, I think there, so there is a lot to do still uh, in order to... Do you know that there are more or less 300 million smallholder farmers in the world without very limit, with very limited access to credit and with no access to insurance? So my point is not only about credit and my disappointment, if I may say about um, what I've been doing, is that my idea was to develop a third pillar in the foundation. One was microfinance, the second one was social business. I would have loved to to develop an initiative in the field of uh, agricultural insurance, and mainly uh, to use the technology, which is today uh, uh, more or less uh, ready, the index-based uh, uh, insurance against climate risk, where mm -hmm. you don't need to go and visit every farmer uh, at the beginning of the contract in order to, uh, to make a photography of the situation. Later on, at the time when you have a uh, disaster because of the climate, and then you have to establish with the, to assess the damages and third, etc. That's a typical process in developed countries, but it's too costly in the context of uh, de uh, developing countries because uh, the experts are too expensive and most time don't, don't exist. But today, with uh, the index-based technology, where you, the observation by satellite or with other techniques of the same type, you can with a good uh, degree of credibility and, uh, and uh, relevance, establish uh, the loss by a given farmer in a given uh, place. And I try to advocate, my purpose is not to make an insurance by yourself. The foundation is not an insurance company and has right. no financial or even technical capacity to do that. But I tried and I didn't uh, succeed, I'm sorry about that, uh, to establish an initiative shared with uh, on the model of the Gavi, the field of vaccination. Gavi is a global alliance for vaccination. I would have loved to establish a global alliance for uh, agricultural insurance in developing countries. It would help a lot. 99% of these farmers have no access to insurance and no trust in insurance. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are almost um, 
uh, going to the end of this conversation. I have a few more questions, but I, I don't think I can get them. So before, uh, my last question will be um, about uh, your suggestion. I know you have been successful so far, and also you have some recommendations uh, to people which you couldn't do in, in your time, but your successors. Uh, <clears throat> so being the, uh, the pioneer in breaking out from this conventional banking to create a support system for unconventional banking system called microfinance. What did you suggest to all leading banks of Europe, US, India, and Japan? What did you propose to them and how would you propose to them? So this is part of one question. And the second question will be, uh, this is the microfinance part of the question. Uh, not question, but it's your comment, like how will you encourage the other banks to do what you have achieved? The second part of the question, if uh, you have um, CEOs of big banks in front of you, uh, how do you, uh, in front of you now, so if you are given to five minute speed pitch to them uh, to get involved with social business and how will you do it? So before we go to this question, can you explain uh, what exactly are you doing now? You finished uh, your, uh, your role in 2015, but now you have a different role now. So can you explain your role now? And from that perspective, uh, if you can say something in two minutes. Yeah, so thank you, Asher. Yeah, well, right now, so I left uh, Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation four years ago, exactly, it was in October. Uh, and immediately Professor Yunus uh, asked me kindly <laughs> whether I would be ready to, to work as his advisor in Paris on a voluntary basis and accepted. And he suggested to establish a very light structure, a kind of embassy of uh, Yunus in Paris and have the name Yunus Center Paris. And uh, what I did together with uh, some uh, people in France, so we created the Yunus Center Paris three years ago as a non-for-profit association dedicated to uh, the support of uh, Professor Yunus when he comes to France. Well, she's not the case right now, but uh, he has been paying a lot of visits to France. Uh, so we are in charge to take care of him and take care of the agenda and to organize things uh, properly and to have huge communication, etc. conferences with business schools, universities, meeting with top officials, etc., etc. But the first purpose, the second purpose is to develop partnerships around the topic of social business with companies, corporates, with uh, business schools and universities, and we are very active in this field right now, and also with local uh, authorities. And the particular topic has been the Olympic Games Paris 2024, in order to make these Olympic Games the most solid solidarity driven, the most inclusive games never observed in the history of the games. So I cannot comment about it because we are too short of time, but Professor Yunus is very much uh, involved in that and we do our best to transform this vision into reality. Now, coming to your last question and to uh, your- before, before that question, just I, I would like to share this with this audience that Paris 2024, the Olympic uh, has uh, one uh, uh, agreement with the Yunus Center that it will be based on social business. So thank you for the great success. Yeah, well, there are many aspects which we should require another lecture if we were to, to, to develop the, the concept. Uh, maybe I, I go to, the, to, to the, your suggested pitch and I will use sure. me. Uh, I don't know whether the audience can see it. Uh, do you, can you see it more or less? Yes, we can see that, yeah. That's the cover letter. In France. With, with French. Cover page of the last issue of the French weekly L'Express about the banks and of, and of the title, the banks and of the world and the image, the image of a dinosaur. So you see? Yeah, I can see that. But mm. you have to explain the meaning because it's in French. Yeah, okay. But uh, the meaning is that, okay, um, while banks are big animals, whatever, they can be different from each other. I'll explain the differences of credit agricole based on cooperative route, very different from HSBC, but all these banks are big animals developing uh, banking business uh, in a relatively conventional way. Uh, and according to this article, I don't pretend that it's a prediction, but nevertheless, 
well, maybe uh, the banks are like dinosaurs and they could die like a dinosaur because they are not adapted any longer to their environment. So what is the today environment of banking activity? It's an environment with a lot of threats, with uh, climate warming, with the loss of biodiversity, but also new opportunities with, of course, the digitalization of business and of relationship. Uh, but there are also social problems which uh, uh, eat uh, the banks, not directly, but indirectly, like, uh, uh, of course, increased inequalities in terms of uh, income and wealth. So if banks don't realize that this environment has been changing a lot and that the millennial, mi millennials, the young people who gradu graduate now from uh, business schools and universities don't want any longer to, uh, to, to, do, uh, to be employed uh, in a very conventional way to get big salaries, bonuses, stock options, whatever. But more and more, not everybody, but many of them now want to go to businesses which make sense, which serve the community, which have a strong and obvious social or environmental impact. If the banks don't realize that, if they don't adapt to the, uh, their model to this new environment, they will die. So that would be the message. So what can they do? I don't know, what, uh, if I was in the, in the shoes of, uh, of the CEO of a big bank, I would say, well, why I should not I try to launch some kind of social business activities? Not necessarily to convert the full spectrum of the banking activities in a social business type, uh, but at least to start, to start something, to test, to see what would be uh, the benefits uh, taken by the, from the, the bank from this uh, experience. So to start social business, at least in one part of the activity, to motivate the employees about it, to embark them even uh, in this way. By the way, I would like to mention that my successor at the head of the uh, of the uh, Grameen Critical Foundation has developed a program of volunteers of solidarity bankers. So uh, taken from uh, the staff of Critical Call on a voluntary basis. And for example, I mentioned the Shepherd's uh, Diary in Senegal. Very recently, a guy, uh, an executive from Critical Call who has some competences from a regional bank of Critical Call in the east of France has decided to go to Senegal and to be seconded to, to this uh, diary for two years to develop a specific program of technical assistance to the, to the elders. So, okay, things are moving. I could take another example from uh, a big competitor of Critical Call, to be fair, uh, which is BNP Paribas. And uh, uh, in the framework of an agreement they signed with Professor Yunus uh, about 18 months ago, uh, they launched a company called uh, Climate Seed which is a social business company dedicated to the uh, kind of marketplace for carbon credits, but according to the social business definition of Professor Yunus. So things are, are moving maybe too slowly, Excellent. but messages are more and more understood. So I just expect that some other Jean-Luc Perron will uh, <laughs> launch new projects in other right. banks bank in every company uh, because it's uh, a lot of uh, joy and happiness. You, Professor Inus, mentioned that many times. Of course, I'm very happy, very proud of what has been achieved thanks to the support I got from Critical Call all along these eight years. Thank you. Thank you so much for this nice explanation that uh, uh, even the greatest dinos dinosaur had to disappear. So the giant banks, if, you're, if they don't really look at what people need right now, what problems we have right now, and as you have mentioned that social business may look new, but somebody should give a try to test it, whether it examine it or, um, so we need uh, many more micro Jean-Luc in each of uh, these banks to take some initiatives from now on. So audience, uh, it, it was a great session. I personally learned a lot from uh, Jean-Luc uh, tonight. 
and uh, tonight from Japanese time perspective. And uh, today we introduced about how a biggest bank in Europe, the largest bank in Europe uh, got into a social business. And also they um, uh, uh, introduced uh, microfinance as well in uh, uh, African countries and also social business in, in, in Asian countries, African countries as well. So uh, I think this video will be recorded so um, people uh, can watch it again. And uh, I would like to thank Jean-Luc uh, for attending this session uh, for the sixth uh, YSBC lecture series. And I would like to uh, give it the mic to uh, Zinat. Zinat. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a very insightful conversation. I thank Professor Ashi for conducting this session so effortlessly. A big thank you to Mr. Perron for sharing his experiences. And of course, to our audience members who are joining, sending their questions and feedback. We try to address as many questions possible, but due to the time constraints, we are limited to a few that we can address. But you can email us at ysbc at unicenter.org with further questions, and we can share it with the speaker and the moderator and um, share their responses too. Now I would like to share about our upcoming event, which is the Social Business Academia Conference happening from November 4th to the 6th. The, social business, the ninth Social Business Academia Conference will be an interdisciplinary conference being held from the 4th to the 6th of November, where academic papers, practitioner cases, and concept notes on innovative ideas and issues around social business will be presented. So this will be taking place both as a virtual and a live event. The live event will be in Colombia in collaboration with our two YSBCs there, Universidad Isesi and Universidad Externado de Colombia. These are our partner universities in Colombia and they will be a part of our SBAC conference. The SBAC will be uh, broadcasted live on our social media pages, so please do check out. On the screen, you'll be seeing some links on how to register. The information is also going to be posted on the chat box of this conversation. And if you also go to the Facebook page of UNO Center and the YSBC page, you can see the links. So please register, attend our conferences. It's over to three days, and we look forward to having you in our social business academia Conference 2020. Uh, finally, you'll be also seeing our next lecture series, um, who the speakers are going to be and when the dates are. So we look forward again to having you both in our lecture series and the SBAC conference. So thank you very much. A slideshow will now play on our, fu on our future lecture. Bye.